Ladies and gentlemen, in a world where the press has so much influence on the population, in the world where press can emotionally influence the decisions people take on a day-to-day -day basis, we think that it would be plain stupid to just let the press just say whatever it wants without any kind of control. And this is what we are arguing for today. We need some leverages on the press. We need to make a system of checks and balances to make sure that the press does not abuse its right and not abuse its power because what we see is that power, great power comes with great responsibility. Now, let's see what our model uh, is like so we see what are, what's the frame of this debate. Now, first of all, say that we put a ban on information that specifically, specifically appeal solely to emotional side of the people. Now, this, that kind of information who create a rage and hatred from the population to a third party uh, per se. And third of all, that, the, that kind of information that affects a huge number of people. And to be extremely certain uh, about what we're going to talk about today, is first of all, that we need some control for uh, disclosing the full horrors of war. That means pictures of extreme violence. And second of all, about those uh, news and news that relates to discrimination and how we need uh, some control on hate speech and that, so on and so forth. Now, we set a commission which uh, will be consist of, consisted of a state supervisor, media analysts, judges, and so on and so forth, so we can assure the correctness of this. And in, in case they break this rule, we will set huge fines, uh, just ban journalists, and so on and so forth. But let's get direct into it. Now, first of all, talking about violence and discrimination in the second argument, my third speaker will talk about the loss of, pol of political uh, legitimacy. Now, first of all, about violence. Now, we see that in a war, you need rational thoughts of starting and ending a war on a, on a large level. Because we say that there are thousands of lives in stake, and you must analyze all the implications when starting and ending a war. Starting from the chances of success, the implication of international relations, the casualties, and so on and so forth. But let's see what's the impact on the population when, they, when the media describes the full horrors of war. They describe that explicitly violent pictures of soldiers being there. No, thank you. Sir. Now, first of all, when they see pictures of their own troops being massacred, we see that the immediate desire is to revenge and to avenge their troops, and they start and uh, uh, they see that they have a certain inclination towards starting a war and continuing a war and so on and so forth. Now, we see that the, when images from, uh, of people from the World Trade Center collapsing, being full of mud and blood and uh, the, so on and so forth, which was very uh, outrageous, we see that the next thing we know that we have a lot of support for Iraq and Afghanistan, oh, thank you, miss, for Iraq and Afghanistan, and guess what? This, uh, 11 years later, we still haven't solved a thing there, just because that we have some artificial emotional support for that war. Now, moving over to, to when they see pictures of their own troops, uh, of, of their troops massacring, uh, massacring other troops. Now, we see that pictures, uh, we, uh, yes. But don't you agree that when people know the full horrors of war, they'll be less inclined to enter in war in the first place, which is good for society as a whole? <laughs> no, no, exactly, exactly this. Uh, this uh, I was going to this uh, in my second part of the argument, but what we are saying is that the war, the ending as the beginning of the war, must be taken on rational basis, not emotional basis, which will be the case if we disclose these type of things. Now, second, uh, second of all, when they see pictures of other troops being massacred by American troops, and so on and so forth. Now, first of all, we must acknowledge that pictures are not relevant towards the policies of war and the success that, says, let's say, American troops have in Iraq and Afghanistan, and so on. Now, uh, uh, some time ago, there was some video uh, viraling through the internet of American troops just shooting down Iraqi civilians from the helicopter saying run chicken run so, or something like that which is extremely outrageous and it's, it is uh, very disclosive. Now when they see this we see that people want actually to stop that war because they perceive it as being very uh, very dominant and very bad and policies not being not being uh, fulfilled. Now if, uh, as a direct result from this uh, type of videos and other type of images, we see that in Libya, the American troops didn't, was very reluctant, no thank you miss, to intervene exactly because they would perceive it as being very, uh, to some extent ineffective and America did not intervene until the, the, the rebels of the, the Gaddafi troops were, were at the gate of Benghazi and a huge massacre, no thank you miss, were, uh, and a huge massacre was about to take place. Now we say that if, if instead the political, um, the political 
st uh, stage intervened uh, you know, quicker than thousands of people might not have died. Now, we said in each of these cases, after they see this, the end result is that they will take military decisions on an emotional basis, which is very wrong, and that, that's why we must not do this. Second of all, the argument of discrimination. Now, we said that in case uh, that an of offense, uh, like a crime or a theft or so on, is committed by a minority, uh, a Hispanic person, um, uh, or so on and so forth, the accent, uh, the accent falls on the ethnic or the, and the minority from, the, from which that respective person be, uh, comes from. And why is this discriminating? Because let's take an example if an old woman dies in America, let's say. Now, if a white, people, if a white person killed it, then the news would be like, a man killed an old lady, right? The, uh, the accent is on the offense. But let's say if a Hispanic person killed her, the, the, the news would be like, a Hispanic person killed an old lady. Right? So we say that in this case, uh, the, the emphasis is on the race and as if the race had anything to do with the offense committed. Now, it, this is a clear case of discrimination because if the media indeed wants to put the emphasis on the comment, on the killing of the old, the old lady, on, the, on, the, uh, on the, um, that, that killing, in both cases it would have said a man killed an old lady because it doesn't really matter if it was uh, Hispanic or Asian and so on and so forth. So we say that the media clearly discriminates people on this, uh, on, on this level and this translates into a general hatred towards a respective minority from those countries due to the fact that the media uh, takes advantage of its power of its, and it's generally uh, discriminative. Now, moving over to my second point uh, of this argument, which, which, which is hate speech, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we say that hate speech comes exactly as a backlash to a minority action. Like a minority, when asking for rights, for more liberties in a society, we have, in a second myth, we have a certain, um, sorry, we have a certain backlash on that, uh, we have a certain backlash towards that action. Now, we say that denying the rights by promoting large-scale xenophobia is a very big thing in society and should be discouraged in every single, in every single case of it happening. Now, we say that when the, you, ha you hear on the radio, on the television, in the press, something like, a certain minority is evil, they don't, they don't have to belong here, they're not as equal as us, they're stupid, they don't have, deserve rights. You see that this has a great impact on the society, and because xenophobia and other thing, we have to argue for that is like a very bad thing and should be, to try, should be tried to minimize that. We said that if we let the free press say these words, and because extremists exist, and if they go to the press, they can't say this without some, without some sort of control, indeed, xenophobia will be uh, present in the society, and we, ha we have a large good hate speech, will, which will con uh, con uh, conclude in the discrimination of the minorities. So, ladies and gentlemen, we said that in these cases, specifically of violence and discrimination, we need some control because unless we don't, we have massive disadvantages upon the society. And for all these reasons, team proposition prevails.
Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to ask you today, how can any democratic society function when the very mechanisms and organizations that were designed to provide that society with information about the actions it government takes on a daily basis, about the actions that are perpetuated against society every day on a daily basis, how can a society function when all that information is limited? We think on side opposition today to win this debate, we have to prove to you that basically the media cannot fulfill its role by being controlled to the degree side proposition has specified today. We would like to do this through three main contentions on our side. Firstly, I'm going to be talking about the chilling effect. Secondly, we're going to be talking about the role of media in society. My partner's going to be talking about citizen journalism. But first, let's go into like what they said and why it was really, really wrong. Okay, so we first take issue with their model. They basically have provided us this very vague system of like where some information was emotional and some wasn't. They never said to us what type of image or what type of media actually elicits an emotional response. Now, in their constructive speech, they mentioned this idea of like when a newspaper would report a murder, they'd say a Latino person would commit this murder. They basically didn't say, was that constituting discrimination under their model? Just because we say the race of a person who does something bad? We'd never heard any like adequate like explanation on what discrimination and hate speech was. Was it just saying the race of someone who did something bad? Or was it basically making racist remarks against that person? They never they really never really explained to us on that side. No, thank you. And then when they were just talking about the horrors of war, they never said, would these horrors of would, would it be applied to horrors of war directly manifested? in press, or would it only be restricted to photos and video? We need explanation to come from our second speaker uh, why, what kind of media we're really talking about today. So in the first argument, they talked about like violence and how when we don't show the full show horrors of war, like basically like people like will have an emotional response and this will somehow be a bad thing. Now they said in their first speech, like to enter a war you must analyze all aspects. And an appeal why we raised, uh, we asked them, how do you expect people to like know what the effects of going into war is if they don't actually like know what that war means? If the horrors of war have not been clearly illustrated to them, no thank you. If the horrors of war haven't been clearly illustrated to them by the media, do they really know what the risk their soldiers face if they send them into the war in the first place? Do they know the risk that the people who they're invading uh, fit, uh, uh, risk like uh, uh, suffer if they invade them? They never like really specified like how we could get the same like depth of information like just by like uh, using like the type of media which they're not controlling, which we really don't know what it is at this point. Okay, and then they talked about like how when we see a violent image, our desires to get revenge always because it's always against like our people we don't think this is wrong we would bring an example of like the uh, video of NATO soldiers like urinating on a fallen Taliban person this actually meant that the NATO soldiers were being held accountable to the actions they were committed in Afghanistan this raised discussion this raised meaningful discourse we don't think that the emotional response from society is actually a bad thing because an emotional response for society based on such a horrendous injustice means that there is more accountability there's a more of a societal move to prote uh, prevent this kind of injustice is happening in the first place. They told us that we can, we should only like have, uh, uh, no thank you, we should only have media on a rational basis and not an emotional basis. They asserted this. They basically never provided us with explanation like why an emotional basis is an inherently wrong idea or why an emotional basis couldn't coincide with a rational basis in the first place. They never basically addressed this. Then they talked about discrimination and they basically talked about like how when we say a Latino person killed someone, that's discrimination. They never explained how this is discrimination in the first place. We further like think that basically when a media portrays a crime. They mentioned the no. They mentioned the characteristics of the offender. That's just kind of what the media do. They also like mention the characters, men, uh, the uh, offender's mental history. They mention like their background. They mention their history. They don't. We don't think that actually this constitutes discrimination on their side. They talked about hate speech and like how we're promoting hate speech. No, thank you. We don't think that hate speech is saying like a, a person of a certain minority committed a crime. We don't think that's hate speech on their side. Furthermore, we think that actually like the media can like be a, like a sufficient recourse to hate speech because like when the hate speech is even like to an extent even commented on in the media, this provides like discussion and debate, and this is actually going on to my constructive argument. Now, my first constructive argument is the chilling effect. How basically, like when we restrict certain like uh, freedoms, no, thank you. When we restrict certain freedoms, the media has this has a more like wide repercussions on society. So what this essentially means is that basically, like in America, for example, when courts are made to decide on like what restrictions free speech should have, they also take into account like whether these restrictions will affect the, the ability of the media to deal with these issues in the first place. Like, where, like if I'm a media body and I know that I could like face like sufficient like judicial recourse if I have published something like will I even talk about that in the first place we would bring the example of like marijuana legal, uh, legislation which basically in America prevented like images of people smoking marijuana in the first place what this led to was an, a, like, a lack of public discussion about marijuana in the first place this is called the chilling effect this is a sociological phenomenon among media organizations we think that basically when you restrict like a media's uh, freedom to voice their opinions and you also like restrict a media's like uh, uh, freedom to like debate those opinions 
opinions, to provide discussion for those opinions, to provide discourse for those opinions. Like discourse is an essentially good thing for Sorry. a society, and we think that side opposition needs to, uh, side proposition needs to prove like why we don't need discourse in the first place. Yes. Why do we, would you want a Hispanic doing a crime to lead to a discussion about Hispanic crime in itself? That's okay. not relevant. Okay, we don't. I, I don't really understand that POI. Like, we don't think that just like because like a Hispanic uh, commits a crime, that all of society will be like, let's like try to like be racist against the Hispanics. They never justify why that would happen in the first place. Like, maybe this is just an insignificant detail. We think that when people look at a crime, they look at the old lady who was killed. They look at the way she was killed. They don't look at the actual race of the person. That is not the most prevalent thing people look at in the first place. Okay, so back to this idea of like role of media in society, uh, which is my second argument, which is role of media in society. Now we think the role of media in society has essentially two purposes, which is firstly education and second accountability. So onto this first idea, which is education. Now we think that essentially when you limit like the, the ability of the media to report the full horrors of war, this like basically makes society like more, uh, more, oh, thank you, more vulnerable to government manipulation. Because when education like isn't like equally distributed, like when a citizen's ability to like see the brutality that's going on in war is like uh, basically limited, then that means that the citizen is not like educated about what's going on in that nation. What is the, ex what is like the purpose of education on like war situations? and violence in other countries in the first place. Well, that means that like, when citizens like basically are going to like a foreign policy de uh, decision, they'll be less inclined to like say to deal with what the, like the politicians are telling us. Like the politicians are telling us this will be a clean, this will be like an unbrutal invasion, and we're more inclined to deal with what we knew from the last invasion, which was this idea that brutality did already happen. We think that an educated populace is a more uh, like a more capable populace of dealing with these kind of issues. We furthermore like think that this adds hesitation to the war decision in the first place, and we also think that when you act when you publish like these images of like war or when you publish images like related to discrimination in the first place this leads to debate this leads to like panel discussions on network like networks like CNN like what is like the relevant issues in our society we think this is an inherently good thing because debate leads to discussion and discussion leads to like meaningful discourse and education among society we would like side off the proposition to prove to us like why citizens shouldn't essentially like like be exposed to this all this debate about these issues and why like they should be like controlled and like uh, like restricted by the state we would like them to justify this now to the second Second idea of the role of media in society, which is accountability. Now, if citizens don't know about like what's happening in the country, this give, essentially gives governments a free pass to do whatever they want. We think that the emotional information that we're talking about in the first place, like, has a lot to do with like the brutality that's taking place. Like, we think that when a, like, like when a news organization would report on a brutality that's happening in another country, and this would be in the print form, it's not as effective as it is in like the emotional form, like the form we're talking about. Which actually we don't know what we're talking about because side proposition hasn't adequately defined that in the first place. But we think that accountability is essentially a good measure for. Like, citizens to have because when the media can report on what it wants to report about the government this adds a measure of accountability to government in the first place sad proposition needs to prove why that's bad okay so what have i talked to you about today i've talked to you about how sad proposition is f f uh, fundamentally like failed to really crystallize and define clearly what this debate was supposed to be about today they failed to clearly define what kind of medias we're talking about they presented these faulty arguments of violence and discrimination we told you on side today that we don't want a chilling effect to take place in society and we want education and accountability to be prevalent among educated citizens in democracies with the media being unrestricted. Thank you. We need a rational. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, we just didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a rational proposition. that we know that we need a rational population, uh, we, let's really look a, a bit about what the media should do. And let's really define what the good media does and what the bad media does. 
with us. The media is all about information. It's all about leading to a better decision. So what we would consider a side government is that we would be happy or happier of a media that through some control leads to the population making better decisions over policies and over how they treat certain groups. So that's the relevant criteria of this debate. Does more media freedom lead to better public decisions, better public information, or does it do otherwise? And if it does otherwise, as I shall prove, we should have some control over the media. So first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, clarifying the real model and how populations react totally emotionally about war. Second of all, about this discrimination and the idea of how um, when you associate an individual's actions with a group characteristic, you get uh, discrimination. And third of all, I'm going to talk about this loss of transparency of government policies, which is my own argument. Now, and after that, I'm going to go into rebuttal. But going into the constructive. Now, clarif clarifying this idea of what we exactly, exactly want to fine or how, on what uh, things we want to actually punish journalists. Okay, there are two things. Violent war pictures or images or descriptions, something like, well, on the 3rd of April, some man had his brains blew out by a certain guy uh, in, during a certain war. Okay, so a very, very explicit visual graphic image or portrayals of them uh, uh, when talking about wars. And if we're talking about ethnic discrimination, the clearest association of racial traits with individual actions. Instead of saying some man or let's say a Romanian citizen committing a crime, you say an ethnic Roma Romanian citizen committing a crime. But I'm going to go, that, go, go to that later. Now getting into my first argument, which wasn't really, really tackled. Right? Because what we've told you inherently was that you have two situations. When you are the one who's attacking and when people see the horrors of attacking, they become allergic to war. When people are perceived as being attacked, and when people see the horrors of being attacked, they become very, very prone to doing war. Now, they've only tackled one of these two cases, the ones in which citizens only see what their soldiers do, and not necessarily what the other side's soldiers do. But what we've told you is that this is not necessarily a good thing, because it leads to an irrational aversion towards war, or an irrational uh, you know, uh, chance of people wanting to go to war. Yes, miss? But sir, don't you agree that nations don't go to war on a whim? It requires more than just somebody getting angry seeing a picture in the newspaper. In 2001, 9-11, a couple of guys bombed the World Trade Center. Media images of people with covered in blood, dust, brains and guts were all over the newspapers. Two weeks later, Afghanistan is invaded by George Bush. And 10 years later, we're still in the damn conflict. What more proof do we want? Then people see, well, they see the other side. Because this is the side of being attacked. When the people see the side of attacking, namely the collateral murders videos of WikiLeaks, in which uh, American GIs were just shooting random civilians to have a good time, you have Libya, in which people see a war, they see that the legitimate side is losing, and they wait two months, okay? They need the threat of a massacre. They need Muammar Gaddafi to come out and say, I'm gonna massacre Benghazi household by household, cockroach by cockroach. That's what they need to actually protect the good guys, okay? We're telling you that when it comes to the decision of war, you want to avoid mob rule. You want people not to see inherently violent images because that's going to put shackles on the politicians who are not going to be able to do, take the right decision. Right? You need reason. And this damages reason very, very much. Yes, sir. You essentially prove on, us to, on your side that why reason can't be compatible with the emotional images we're talking about. Yeah, of course it can be compatible. That's why we're fining and banning journalists who do this, because we don't want this emotional response to actually exist. Okay? Now, second of all, on this idea of discrimination. Now, what they didn't actually, re they, they, they didn't specifically rebut the argument. All that they said was, oh, you know, media kind of tells us about the characteristics of the guy who do the crime. That's not the argument, okay? The argument is that when a certain group 
is known for certain misbehaviors, such as the Roma people in Romania, which are infamous for giving us as ethnic Romanians a bad image, when you therefore come and present a crime that fits those characteristics and you say that the person was part of that minority, you accentuate the discrimination. You accentuate this idea that those people do that crime because they're Roma, not because they're criminals per se. So the media might do this. We say it's bad. We say they should be fined and in extreme cases banned for this. And going on to my third idea, this idea of loss of legitimacy and transparency. Because when the media inherently decides what people emotionally think and inherently controls them, because let's face it, everyone is emotional. Everyone kind of responds to this picture. When you see someone's brains or guts on the floor, it's not a decision, hmm, am I liberal or socialist? No, the response is clear and it's the same. You want, you think like every population responds the same. This means that the media is inherently decides and manipulates what the population, population think, and therefore, secondly, the population decides what the government do. Now, if they're so concerned about accountability, who's accountable? Is the politician accountable who's really pressed by the population to do this and who's going to, you know, lose his job if he does not? Or should the media be held accountable? Well, it's clear that the media should be held accountable because they're provoking the only real response that the population could ever actually have from this publishing of violent images. Yet they're not the ones who are this accountable. If they're so concerned about accountability, why don't they prove some accountability for media? And now, going on to the rebuttal. Now, on this idea of chill effect, of chilling effect. We don't necessarily understand why, we, why one man or one man's actions, be it one crime or one, uh, one uh, I know, war aggression, should lead to some discussion about war per se. It's not relevant. When one soldier is just deranged, that doesn't mean you have to discuss the whole war. When one person of one ethnic minority is deranged, you don't have to, you're out of order, you don't have to discuss the ethnicity per se. And second of all, this idea of education. Now, this is not really education or the role of the media for information. Because, you see, even though they would inform us about how long the guts of the guy who's actually being blown up by the bomb are, we don't see that as being relevant. Why is it relevant to know that the criminal was Roma or black? Or why is it relevant to know that in a war some guy did that kind of atrocities? And on this point that people don't know, like, you're claiming people don't know that other people die in war. Like, really, get real, sir. That's the only information they need to know. That people die and we should be rational. And because this need actions provoke an irrational backlash and response of the population, because they're not accountable for the backlash they created, we should clearly find them and ban them, if need be, when they take these actions. <laughs> especially in their last speech, tried to bring forward this idea of good media versus bad media. They talked to you a lot about how good media is one that influences the population to make better decisions. What we think, ladies and gentlemen, is no, that's not what a good media does. Good media enables the people to make decisions in the first place, ladies and gentlemen. Good media enables people to see every side of the story, to have all the information, and then make their own reasonable deductions, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what they think, that's what we think they haven't uh, proven to you today, the burden of exactly what the media is supposed to do, ladies and gentlemen. 
So essentially, what I'm going to be doing as the second speaker for the opposition is talking to you um, ex about the third contention on the opposition, um, which is the idea of citizen journalism and how this is essentially effective in you know, enhancing the idea of a democracy and transparency within um, a de democratic government. Before I go into that, let's go into exactly what the proposition has told you, you know, within their last point, as well as their case in general. So firstly, Jamal brought up many, many different problems within their model. We saw that essentially they didn't very, very well you know, clarify the idea of a emotional reactions. They didn't clarify whether those emotional, um, why exactly those emotional reactions are bad. They um, brought up the idea of racist m remarks, but Jamal clearly told you that it's not the idea that, you know, the race of a person is going to be the determining and the largest factor within an event itself. He also told you that the race of the people that are committing the crime is fact, ladies and gentlemen, and those facts need to be told to the public in order for the public to be able to make decisions. Now, no, thank you. Now, another problem that we found within their model was that they didn't actually, you know, tell you what kinds of fines they would implement. They didn't tell you exactly um, to what extent you know, the journalism had to be of an emotional level. We still don't know what emotional level really is. Um, and so that's why we don't know exactly when they would ban journalists at all. Now, the second idea problem we have is within their first point. They brought up the idea of how you know, war, the beginning and ending of war depends on the emotional status of the people. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that essentially uh, when people send others, uh, or when people make the decision to send their troops into war, you know, they're, they're, they have to be aware of the risks, ladies and gentlemen. They have to be uh, aware of the variables within war, ladies and gentlemen. They have to know exactly what's happening to the people. And we think that essentially we can't do that. We can't fulfill the burden of you know, giving every possible amount of information to the people. And again, I'm going to be going into why every bit of information is relevant, ladies and gentlemen. But, you know, and also, uh, and also another reason that they think that they brought up within their case was that, um, you know, the decision of war rests with the politicians, but, you know, essentially because, you know, the people put pressure on them, they're going to, you know, not be able to make uh, proper decisions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we think that that underestimates the idea of a politician in the first place. We know that a politician is someone who needs to do exactly what's best um, for the country, and we think that essentially if they can't fulfill, you know, those ideas um, and fulfill exactly what the government wants them to do in general, we think they're not worthy of being politicians, ladies and gentlemen. And that's the idea of a democracy, you know, making the best decisions um, for the country, but having the people in mind at the same time. Now, essentially, they brought up the idea of 9-11. Um, what we would say is that 9-11, the pictures didn't actually escalate the war. There were many other factors, ladies and gentlemen, but what the pictures of those 9-11, those twin towers that essentially had blood and guts everywhere did, ladies and gentlemen, was it showed the people um, exactly the horrors of what happened. But what they failed to realize and what they failed to show you is that discussion has two sides, ladies and gentlemen. When we're giving people, you know, the fact that, you know, a Hispanic woman has, or a Hispan Hispanic man, no thank you, has killed another Hispanic man. What's also happening within, you know, the promotion of discussion um, is, you know, we're talking about different sides of the racism of, um, you know, being Hispanic in the first place. Not only that, but we think that, you know, the idea of, like, being Hispanic isn't the dominant idea within the event itself, which Jamal has very clearly shown you. Um, and we was also saying that, you know, the, uh, they've also, we brought up the idea that saying the race of a person in a community um, is, you know, fact, as well that the, of the fact that it actually promotes discourse in the first place. Um, so again, w once again, we would say that, you know, we've clearly, very clearly brought down this point of, you know, discussion and how it's a bad thing um, and, you know, giving people every possible fact. Yes? If I commit a crime and I'm a Christian, why should this even lead to the a uh, question of are Christians evil? Ladies and gentlemen, okay, thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that that's you know, the essential idea of discussion, ladies and gentlemen. We know that's how we can come to a consensus one day. That's how we can, you know, bring together or bring up, essentially, the ideas of Christianity. That's what we're doing in the debate today, ladies and gentlemen, bringing up both sides so that we can come to a conclusion. That's what the point of discourse is, and that's exactly what Jamal has shown you throughout their case, and we think that they haven't proven to you, this to you at all. Um, so essentially what the third uh, speaker did um, you know, was the fact, again, of like emotional and how it leads to decision. We think that their entire case, ladies and gentlemen, rests simply on the fact that emotion dictates exactly what happens within a country. We think that this is really wrong. We think that they haven't proven to you the essence of the media. We think that they haven't proven to you, um, you know, exactly why the media is important when actually like dictating the result of decisions and how decisions are made. And that's what we think that they have to prove. That's what we think they haven't done. So getting into the third point on side um, opposition today. My point, and what I'm going to be proving to you, is the idea of citizen journalism. We think that it is essential for the people to be allowed, you know, to, to put up information and put up um, information on a global level for the world to see, ladies and gentlemen. Here we would look at the idea of Julian Lassange and the WikiLeaks ordeal, ladies and gentlemen. We'd see that, you know, essentially um, this very important information was leaked to the press. Now, why is this good? Well, we'd say that Bradley Manning, the government officer that actually, you know, leaked the information to Bradley Lassange in the first place, um, leaked information of embarrassing diplomatic cables, evidence of corruption, things that obviously the government didn't want the public to see. But we think that th because those, um, those, you know, that information was leaked to you know, cables like the New York Times, uh, like 
Al Pais, which was Spanish, or else like The Guardian from the UK. We think that essentially, it, it, no, thank you. The fact that these were legit, legitimate media corporations actually, you know, expanded the idea of the free press. The fact that you know now people knew exactly what was happening within the government. We think that that was essential, you know, to the idea of democracy in the first place. We think that it's very important that this happen. Now, the other idea is just the expansion of media in general, ladies and gentlemen. We think that now more than ever, the idea of free press, the idea of you know posting blogs, posting things on Facebook, you know, just posting your ideas for the internet in general, and posting pictures of, you know, things that have happened in the past. It's actually very, very important to the idea of a, of a democracy. And we think that, you know, the, the relationship between people and the media is very important. And with this resolution, it would actually be hindering the idea of, you know, people interacting with the press in a positive manner. And here again, we would look at the idea of the picture of the girl in Afghanistan, the girl you know, with a burqa who was sitting, and we saw it like into her eyes. We, we read about the, the hardships that she had to go through, you know, in order to just determine the shape and course of her life um, within Afghanistan. But this didn't make us more racist towards Afghanis and the way they live their lives, ladies and gentlemen. That's not what the essence of the picture was. But what the essence of the picture was was essentially to you know promote discourse, promote the idea of exactly what was happening in Afghanistan and how it was relevant to our lives, you know, in Canada, in America, in Western liberal democracies, ladies and gentlemen. And we think that that was essentially very, very important. And that was essentially something that, you know, shed light on the, the you know, the state of the Af Afghani government um, during that time. We think that it's the same thing within the idea of, you know, like transparency, accountability within the government. That's the only way that the government actually has a legitimate way of being accountable to the people, ladies and gentlemen. And we haven't seen, you know, any kind of rebuttal on this. Jamal brought it up. I brought it up. We haven't seen any kind of, you know, rebuttal, any clash with this idea whatsoever. All we've heard, and, you know, exactly all that we've heard from the proposition is that emotion is a bad thing. Emotion leads to negative decisions. And we think that essentially they haven't proven even that to you today. So, you know, because we've talked to you about like the idea of, you know, how banning journalists about, we've talked to the idea of, you know, like hindering the ability of a people and the government, you know, to be like on the same level, ladies and gentlemen. And because we've clearly proven to you how their first um, speaker and how their second speaker clearly didn't outline you know, the essence of the debate. We think that we've proven to you so far that media cannot fulfill with um, their role, with the extent of the control of the proposition is trying to show you today. We think that we've clearly proven to you, you know, Jamal's first point um, and, and his second point as well as mine, the idea of citizen, um, citizen journalism. We've clearly proven to you the idea of how this essentially makes the government more accountable. It makes the people more aware. And because we believe in free press, because we, had the, we believe in the idea of people knowing exactly what they're getting into within the government, we proudly beg to oppose. Thank you. a random decision that my mama took when I was a little. I somehow got to Italy when I was young. And I can tell you, and I can tell you really well, that in Italy, if there will be a crime that's committed by some Romanian guy, the title would be something like, Gypsies hit again. It, not, it won't be about it, and anyone who lives in Europe can account for that, ladies and gentlemen. Now, going on to the debate and what we've seen actually today, I have three major points. I will talk about the purpose of the media. Then I, will sh I shall analyze the issue of discrimination against the chilling effect. And thirdly, I shall analyze the true horrors of war and how, it, uh, how our policy impacts and benefits the society. Now, going on to the purpose of media, what both teams have agreed basically is that media is designed to, to provide people with objective information, right? Now, what happens, in, what happens nowadays is that media makes appeal to emotion. 
Emotion is one of the easiest way to persuade people who cannot filter information well enough through a reasoning filter, okay? And this is mostly met in the mass of population. What is the best mechanism of making appeal to emotions, if not visual images, ladies and gentlemen, if not highlighting the nation of, I don't know, highlighting that a gypsy did something, a Hispanic, a Hispanic did something, and so on and so forth. This is the easiest way to manipulate people. It's not convincing them. It is manipulating them against Probably they're even their own values per se, ladies and gentlemen, because visual images, real visual images, and emotion have a very strong effect on population, and we do not want a media that controls the population, ladies and gentlemen. What our what team opposition has completely ignored in the last speech was no, thank you, was our extension, and basically why it should be the governments, the people that we delegate to decide our nation's policy, to, to actually decide them, not media corporations, ladies and gentlemen. And what we've been telling you is that if you analyze the situation in Europe, I, and I believe you all agree that the European Union is a good thing, what has been happening all around the Europe, uh, the, the, in, in Europe is that minorities are being discriminated more and more. There's a general hatred towards people who are not from, you see, from the same country. And this is precisely because the media can and has a very huge impact on those issues. No, thank you. It's not necessarily because people actually feel that way. They are manipulated to feel that way. Now, um, before I go to my second point, I want to counter argue the, the, the WikiLeaks thing that they've brought on the last page and basically tell you that in today's debate, because if you were to choose all the topics that you can discuss about, you couldn't possibly do that in an eight minute speech. We chose to types, uh, we chose to limit press into different situations, which is war and discrimination. We didn't talk about government accountability in this debate, and we don't find that it is relevant. Uh, no, thank you. We do not find that uh, the WikiLeaks example is relevant. Is that relevant to what we're discussing today? Moreover, we've, pro we've proven you that there were WikiLeaks examples that worked in our favor. Uh, for example, what happened in um, Iraq with with the USA soldiers. Okay, uh, but before I go on, yeah, point, sir. WikiLeaks provided information of brutalities committed against Afghanis that was reported by no other media outlet. Okay, thank you. Who exactly. else but the media to report this? Uh, thank you, but <laughs> the problem is that we've proven to you that that information should have not been leaked at our point of um, the true horrors of war. But let me get there. Uh, okay, now my second point: discrimination versus the chilling effect. What team? opposition today simply does not want to understand is the true impact of the media. They kind of accused us that it's, it's not that important. I mean, the fact that you write there the nation is not that important and it doesn't have that of a big effect on the population overall. But this is false, ladies and gentlemen. This is so false. And I can give you countless examples. I can give you examples from Italy, Spain, French, wherever you want them from. Because it is simply very easy to understand why this works. If media presents a different, if media presents a crime, a crime, ladies and gentlemen, which is inherently bad and people associate, you know, this ethnical groups with crimes, then you gradually build hatred. If a crime was committed by a French guy in France, it would have been something like his name committed a crime, right? If this crime was committed by some other nation that they don't like, it would have been that specific nation committed the crime. And here's how people make the link. Here's how the mechanism works. And the problem is that this, uh, this is a self-fueling thing. Because crimes are made by all types of people. But the only ones that get highlighted from a racial point of view are those that the media chooses to. This is where manipulation enters the room. And this is where the opposition fails in this debate. Now, there is a different, there's a second point, no thank you sir, there's a second point at the discrimination issue. And they, 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 they come and tell you that it's, you have discussion. In their model, you have discussion. But as 
Uh, not only is it false, ladies and gentlemen, because it's not like you'll see um, a gypsy guy committed a crime. Now let's discuss on the crime. We, uh, we won't discuss on the fact that crimes are bad and so on and so forth, but we'll rather discuss how should we evict these gypsies and how should we uh, throw away other people that are of, di of different ethnic groups. So even if, even if you create discussion, which is like this probably is a small chance of having discussion on such issues, what you do is create discussion that does even more harm. So they, no, thank you. So they lose this point at two levels, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, going on to uh, our last point. Ah, what the plan management I had. <laughs> uh, going last to my last point, which is the true horrors of war. Um, <laughs> Uh, what we've been telling you is that in order to make good decision regarding such international issues, you make you gotta make them rationally. You have you need reason before everything. And why? And since we both agreed that you need objective input information in order to make this decision, let's see why those true horrors of war, those pictures of brains splashed everywhere, is not objective information. First of all. Uh, they are, uh, in many, many pictures, might be very particular cases, you know? I mean, it might be a situation that occurs one, uh, one, once in 100 days. It's not objective. It's a really subjective and small part of the total things that happened during the war. Moreover, we've told you that even if this wasn't so, the harm is even greater because you have two sizes of the coin, ladies and gentlemen. You have sizes where, uh, due to some images, people are manipulated to go to war, but you also have the side when people do not go to war due to the same reason. And this is what happened in Libya, ladies and gentlemen, where America didn't intervene, uh, where America stood, took their hold, held their grounds until the, I know, uh, Gaddafi's army was close, really, really close to Benghazi. It could have been, uh, this could have been prevented and things could have been solved easier. Ah, allora, grazie. Bye. The side proposition that we've heard today has essentially characterized citizens as these uninformed animals who are essentially only controlled by their emotions and they don't think, they don't read, they, they don't think about anything critically, they just accept what the media spoon feeds to them and this is why the country is going down the drain. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't accept this on many bases and, and I'll be going through um, all, of the, all of the clash that we've heard so far today on side uh, opposition and prove to you on why all of these big questions that we've heard, we've clearly feel that side opposition has won the debate today. So firstly, I'll be looking at this issue of emotion versus rationality that came up a lot. And secondly, I'll be looking at how the media does or does not reinforce certain stereotypes and what the effect of this is. And thirdly, I'll be looking at this question of the role of media in democracy. So essentially what we heard throughout the, all of their speeches is the idea that sh citizens should not hear, see, or read anything that makes them angry. They should basically, it's not okay for a populace to get outraged over the actions of the troops who are representing them abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, we fundamentally disagree. If we as a populace did not get angry, um, citizens, uh, that soldiers in Abu Ghraib prison would still be sexually humiliating their, so, uh, um, um, their, their prisoners. We think that things like this, ladies and gentlemen, are fundamentally the reason that, uh, that citizens should be able to see exactly what their tax dollars are paying for. And 
then we heard this idea that basically the citizens shouldn't get to see the nine uh, citizens of America should not get to see 9/11 pictures just because it made them angry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we think that at, t at a time of a national tragedy, that is exactly the wrong time for the government to be censoring images. This is the right time for the government to be building trust, building a relationship between them and their people. This is a time for national unity. This is not the time for a condescending government to paternalistically decide that their people, this is just too much, this will make the brains explode, therefore people shouldn't get to see what happened to their own fellow man in New York on that day. So because of that, because we strongly believe that Americans have the right to know what happened to them and they have the right to know the extent of the, the graveness of this, we firmly believe that they should get to see these images. And then we heard this false assertion that those pictures are essentially exclusively the reason that America went to war two years later. No, ladies and gentlemen, America went to war two, uh, two weeks later because that was essentially an egregious harm to their national security. It was an egregious attack to America. That's why they went to war. They, don't, they did not get to war because people saw some pictures of guts. Okay, now moving on to this next idea. Is that, okay, so essentially we see a side proposition that's split just completely un, unequivocally against emotions in all cases. Ladies and gentlemen, we on side opposition see that emotions are the vehicle through which empathy happens. As, as um, Dana brought up to the idea of that Afghan girl, and we read her, we did read her graphic story, okay? We learned what it was like to, for her to live um, in a situation like that. And so because of this, because of the graphicness, and because of the horror of her story, we empathize. And we think that's truly important in, in, in you know, a time when we're supposed to be building global citizens, when we're supposed to be making global connections. This is a time to look beyond your nationality, to be able to empathize with a 15-year-old girl across the world in a country you've never heard of. Okay, so uh, again, we've heard this, um, I'd like to clarify that essentially what we've heard is this false dichotomy. It's only possible to make business, um, make decisions based on rationality, and basically they, they want to eliminate emotion entirely from the picture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, emotion is an important part of the human psyche, and we firmly disagree that this is a bad thing all the time. Okay, and then we heard this idea of, of how somehow emotion caused egregious harms because we didn't get into Libya soon enough. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we did not go into, again, go into or go out of Libya because of, because of pictures. We, we, we did it based strategically on how the rebels were doing and when would be the best chance for success, not because of, you know, some NATO, uh, NATO video of run, chicken, run. All right, now moving on to this idea of the media, media not reinforcing stereotypes. So basically the largest refutation that we heard on this idea of the chilling effect is that, oh, basically, yes. um, Basically, it's, it's not really relevant. It, it's, it, it doesn't really make sense in this debate. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the reason that the chilling effect is so is so essential to this debate is because they talked a lot about oh not letting you know um, people know that a Latino person committed this crime. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we don't think that we, we think our relationship with race is co is very complicated. You know, throughout Western liberal democracies, especially in places where there's a lot of immigration. Okay, so our relationship is complicated. We don't think that the answer is lying through omission. We don't think that the that the answer is clouding up the facts and just pretending that it's not really happening. That there's not a problem with greater amounts of of crime in in certain populations. We think that again this chilling effect so basically we're not allowed to talk about race and crime together that's essentially the idea that we're getting from side proposition so because of this we won't be able to talk about the underlying social issues that are causing you know people like Roma or causing people like blacks in the United States to commit crime disproportionately so we think this is a very bad thing this actually prevents you know the kind of discourse that they dismissed so easily on side proposition and so because of this because it's essential for you know social welfare and to move to on for, um, I'll take you in a moment and to move forward in society, we think that this is a very bad idea. Yes. But team opposition doesn't understand that you don't you don't solve problems between ethnic generations by writing up a gypsy kill a man. No, okay. Well, we don't think that this issue is really about derogatory terms for certain race racial minorities. We think that this issue is about like you know people who commit crimes, and we look at the underlying reasons for this. We think that the media has a bigger role than just to report on single isolated incidents. We see that the media does more than this. The media talks about trends, about patterns, about reasons that certain people do things so because of this ladies and gentlemen as I just told you we think that it's very important to not just you know pretend that you know certain things aren't happening in the world because we think that certain people may enact racist policies against this we think that this is very bad ladies and gentlemen it was prevent the kind of discourse that would prevent this kind of thing from happening because then we won't even know the reason why people are committing this in the first place okay so now moving on to this idea of um, the role of media in democracy now essentially we heard this very confusing case from side 
proposition. They would essentially have you believe that the media like creates racism and the media like creates violence all on the, all on its own. You know, it's like it's, it's just like this artificial fictional body that just creates these social problems. They are the source of the problems, ladies and gentlemen. We on side opposition fundamentally disagree. So first we would question why the media has an incentive to like to basically create these problems like racism and violence. We don't think that this is the case. We don't think that like the media will like get rich off of creating violence and creating racism in a society. We think that there are you know other people in power who are actually perpetuating these issues and we think that you know um, that this, this is the type of thing that we should be addressing through the use of our media. Jamal told you how the media keeps people accountable. Why it's why our WikiLeaks example is relevant because this is all about governmental accountability especially in cases of the full horror of war. We think that it, it's important to have um, it had this body in democracy that basically informs and influences the way we make decisions, yes, by providing us with information that allows us to really substantively come up with that information. We think that, you know, they're essentially confusing the roles of corrupt politicians with the media. We don't think that this is the one and the same. And said proposition has refused to, to like basically show us why this evil like global corporate media conglomerate has this agenda of like creating issues such as like gypsy as as like higher um, amounts of, of amounts of crime involved uh, Roma. So because we because um, we've heard a lot of assertions again about like this this drive to manipulate people using emotions and we don't really buy <coughs> ladies and gentlemen because we have a greater faith in humanity than side opposition does side proposition does because we know that humans are capable of more than blindly thinking and uh, being horrified by a picture and thinking that the next logical reason is to uh, kill a whole bunch of people in another side of the world. So because of this, we firmly beg you. To, um, to support side opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, today in this debate, we had a sad proposition that presented us with a false dichotomy. They basically said we could either have a society where we made deci good decisions based on rational kind of media, or a society where we made bad decisions based on emotional kind of media. Today we had a side opposition that clearly addressed that. We had a side proposition today that fundamentally, time and time again, asserted this wrongful uh, perception of what the role of media is in society. They asserted what the media actually influenced in society, and we had a side opposition that addressed the true nature of media. How by passing this resolution, we would damage what the media does in society, how we would damage like what, uh, how the media holds governments and people accountable, and how information is inherent in its function in democracy. So before, let's go into these two main areas, or two main actors rather, in this motion and see why side opposition had the better responses to uh, affect these actors. Firstly is the media and the government, and second of all is society. So onto this first idea, which is media and government. Now side proposition had this very per uh, perverse view of like what the role of media should be. It said that the role of media should be to to inform people so long as it doesn't create anger, so long as it doesn't create controversy, that we should essentially have a sanitized media. Now my partner Sonam clearly addressed in her uh, in her web speech that actually by actually like uh, inspiring emotion among people, we better like uh, uh, fulfill the role of the media. That actually sometimes emotional evidence, because it is reported in no other way, is actually essential to holding people accountable. And the event, we essentially saw a very skewed version of what the media should do on side pro uh, proposition. Today on side opposition, we heard insufficient analysis to justify why the chilling effect didn't take place in this debate. Like, why would we restrict some media rights that we actually have almost a slippery soap, then we actually have, like, create hesitation for the media to deal with these issues in the first place? We never actually heard really sufficient analysis on what the role of media should be in the first place. We are, I, 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 in my first speech, told you that the role of media should be to educate and hold people accountable. Because in a democracy, if you don't know what your people are doing in other countries, if you don't know what your troops are other doing in other countries, then that's not OK. 
paid, then the government is basically getting a free pass to do whatever they want because they're not being held accountable. We virtually really heard no response to this. They basically based their whole uh, and, and basically they based their whole idea on like media is just a, a, basically a media is just like influence society as a whole. And let's go on to the next theme, which is like how media doesn't influence society in the way that they, they describe. So basically, and the second theme of society, now they basically said that because like we attach like adjectives to people who commit crimes, because we call a person who killed someone Latino, that that basically is the reason why racism happens in the first place. And we think it's sort of uh, adequately addressed this by saying that the reason racism happens in the first place is underlying societal issues. And we also heard a sufficient analysis from me and Dana that basically the real uh, the real uh, matter at heart in this crime is not the race of the person that happens. That in fact, when people report crimes, they actually report all aspects of the crime. They not only report the race, they report the height, they report the weight, they report the socioeconomic class. We heard no really reply on this on their side. They basically said that, that the role of the media should like not be foster these stereotypes. Now, essentially, what Sonam told you is that by actually like reporting these crimes, we actually foster a discussion about the real uh, uh, issues of race in our society. We haven't heard a sufficient response to them on this point. They basically had this uh, us believe in this false dichotomy between emotion and reason. Now, in a POI I raised, I asked them why couldn't they be compatible. He said that, yes, they could be compatible, and they he ended up with this confusing response. But we're going to ban emotion anyways. We essentially think that emotion goes hand in hand with reason. Now, Dana sufficiently proved this, and Dana and Sonam sufficiently proved this by saying that emotion inspires empathy, that emotion inspires a greater understanding of the issues that face society. We haven't heard sufficient analysis on their side. We haven't heard sufficient analysis of why when emotion is coupled with reason, like why when not only do we know about issues, but we can feel strongly about them and take action on them, that that is an essentially bad thing for society to do. We essentially heard a side proposition that told us that because like we saw images of 9-11, because we saw images of violence, we were either less likely to intervene in Libya or more likely to intervene in Afghanistan. We think this was really essentially a contradiction on their side. They never really proved to us like why when we see brutalities committed against our own people and why we see brutalities committed against other people that this actually like damages war. We think it makes citizens more aware of war. We think on the whole today, side opposition has stood for democracies and information. We think we have stood for the role of media in proper d democratic societies and we beg to oppose still. So, <laughs> Now, when I see a huge bear outside my house that could sometimes help me haul heavy things and sometimes eat me, I don't say, can I live with this? I said, why do I need this? Let's get this out. And that's the real strategical mis you know, uh, mistake of side opposition. Because when seeing the possibility of the angry mob to exist, they didn't see why, they didn't tell us why do we need this? Why do we need, what's the positive externalities of seeing the guts roll? They told us, oh, we can live with this. People are not necessarily that emotional. So the question, the biggest question I tend to ask side opposition today is what do we gain? Where are the positive externalities? And if that's balanced out by some opportunity of a disadvantage versus no positive externalities, we clearly carry this, this debate home. So really, let's see how, did they, how they did attack our case today. Now, they told us two things. First of all, that this uh, kind of violent images promote the idea of a discussion because people like to inherently what want to be informed. Now we've clearly responded to this and we've told you that people generally, you know, kind of tend to know that other people die in war. We've told you that in many times when you have the angry mob, the discussion is hurt. And this matters because they didn't prove the existence of an opposition, right? We 
constantly try to prove to you how hatred exists when you see the guts rolling, how hatred exists when you see your misconceptions being enforced by racial stereotypes. They've only told us that, well, emotions lead to empathy. But we didn't talk about empathy here, right? We were talking about hatred. We were talking about oppressive emotions. Just stating that, I don't know, these pictures lead to empathy doesn't really prove that you're going to create an opposition. They fail to prove it, right? How can, he never actually told us how specifically seeing your soldiers shot, for instance, can lead to empathy. How seeing a gypsy stealing your stuff can lead to empathy. So in most, if not all of the cases, they didn't prove the existence of a discussion. They just stated it and then backed, up with it, backed it up with rhetorics. But even more to this idea of discussion, we've told you that even if you could make discussion exist, which is highly doubtful, well, the media are not interested in that. And Flav, Flav, my third speaker, was very, very focused on this, on how they are actively into manipulating people. They're actively into searching something that has a huge emotional response, because that's what sells. So what we've proven to you on this side of the house is that there is no discussion today because of their lack of proof. And this is why the angry mob is the young one that stands at the end of this debate. So going on to what this means for the world. Well, this means that we live in a world in which wars are conducted irrationally, right? We attack just because we're mad, not because we know how to attack. And we'd rather take some exceptional flaws, such as, you know, some we slip up and sometimes have an, a, a, a jail that's not necessarily correct, rather than have a system that's inherently flawed. We'd rather take some exceptional mistakes of the system rather than have a system who can't even decide when or how to go to war and inherently is fall and therefore should be scrapped. And second of all, on this idea of discriminatory and racial hatred. We've told you that this is one of the, uh, also one of the most important things. We've told you that this drives politicians to deport gypsies without giving them legal, legal rights, even though they kind of are European citizens and can go into the Schengen zone. We've told you that the politics of hatred thus created, and uh, that was not refuted, leads to irrational policies with huge consequences. And we don't want that. We want people to be informed and to stay informed. And because seeing violent images and seeing these portrayals doesn't help them be informed, they've clearly lost this debate.